All right, I'm back, and we're going to finish up our conversation on learning by discussing the most recent model of learning, which is learning by observation, peer pressure. Come on, all the cool kids jumped. I, I think... I, I think those are dinosaurs and an elephant or they're kangaroos. I don't know what that is. But anyway, the cool kids jumped and uh, the elephant's not jumpy. Um, the the guy who we attribute really bringing forward the idea that we learn by observing others was Albert Bandura. And you may have heard of Bandura and his Bobo doll research. It was conducted early in the 60s. And he, in fact, it's so long ago that he didn't have videotape. He had to record using the, the old... Super 8 video uh, uh, movies, what are they called? Um, film. I can't even remember the name. Film. Um, you notice the Bobo doll. It's an inflatable doll that is made out of plastic or rubber. I don't know, you know, kind of malleable plastic. It's got a imprint of a clown on the front and the back, and um, it's got sand in the bottom. So when you punch Bobo, he bounces back up, right? And so the, the design of the toy is to punch it, kick it, throw it, you know, things like that. And normally, if you just let children play with the Bobo doll, they do what the Bobo doll was designed for, punch it, kick it, and throw it, stuff like that. So what they did was they got adults, in this case, a lady who is dressed very much like she thinks she's on Leave it to Beaver with her little pencil skirt and her blouse and her heels. And uh, so they ask her to do some very specific postures while engaging with Bobo. So she straddles him and punches him in the face. She throws him. She hits him with a hammer. Um, so very specific things. And then they have these small children watch her interacting with Bobo. And then after they watch the video of her doing that, then they have the opportunity to interact with Bobo. And then there are also things in the laboratory that they could they could use too, like the hammer. It's a toy hammer. But like the hammer, and, and actually there's a toy gun there. They would never have that today. But a um, bunch of different things that they could interact with Bobo with if they wanted to, or play with instead. They didn't have to play with Bobo. What they found is that after watching the adult film, that the children were engaging in identical behaviors that, that were not naturally admitted by other children. They made sure that the that the adult was displaying behaviors that they had not seen in the in the um, focus group of children playing with Bobo, so that if these children did it, it was clear because, that they were doing it because they got the idea from the adult in the film strip. And one of the things that's um, problematic about Bandura's conclusions is that he thought, well, see, this is evidence that kids will observe what, you know, what's happening on TV and then they'll um, display it in the real world. And there's not a lot of evidence for that per se, but there is evidence that when I watch a film and see these behaviors, I'm in a setting, there's nothing else to do except for play with what's here, I will use what I just saw while I interact with the toy. So we call this modeling. Modeling is when we imitate the behavior of a specific other person. In this case, they were modeling the behavior of the lady who was beating up Bobo. Here's an example of two monkeys. Kind of looks like one monkey reflective. It's two monkeys here that you're seeing on the bottom, uh, monkey left, monkey right. Um, and they're separated by a, a window. And they each are seeing the screen above them. So monkey on the left, they're calling him monkey A. He's seeing that array of pictures where you've got the bird up in the upper right corner of his screen. You get the, the flowers and the motorcycle and the, and the sculpture. Monkey B has the same objects, but they're in different positions. So um, monkey B pushes, touches one of those objects, and a food reward comes out. Monkey A is cheating, right, looking over and, and seeing what monkey B picks, sees that monkey B got a reward for picking the motorcycle, let's say. And so monkey A looks at his own screen, touches the motorcycle, and gets the reward. Learning by observation, modeling the behavior of the monkey next to him. We assume that this is how most of our behaviors are acquired, right? That we look around at our peers, we look around at our parents, we look at TV and other media sources, and we um, you know, model the behavior of people that we look up to or people that we want to be like. Um, monkey A was imitating monkey B because monkey A wanted the reinforcement. Maybe we want some kind of reinforcement also, right? We want... Um, acceptance or we want um, you know, people to respect us or something like that. 
we think now that the um, part of our brain that allows us to do this kind of observational learning it um, contains mirror neurons. That there are these neurons in our brain that allow us to observe somebody else and have our brain respond very similarly to as if we had actually experienced the thing ourselves. So on the left, we see a brain of a person who's actually experiencing pain. That's a functional MRI that we're looking at. So this is a person who's actually experiencing pain on the left. And then on the right is somebody watching that person experience pain. Now you'll notice not all the same areas are lit up because some of those areas are literally sensation areas and those are the part of the brain that are actually processing the actual pain. The person on the right is displaying those mirror neurons where they are experiencing empathy for the pain. So we think that a lot of observational behaviors are, um, are probably guided by the fact that our brain can sort of put ourselves in the position of somebody else. Mirror neurons were accidentally discovered. I'll, it seems like um, this whole chapter is full of stuff where they didn't mean to find what they found. Um, they had a monkey who had an e, you know, EEG pads around on his, on his scalp, and they were um, testing um, you know, which part of the brain was firing as he reached for a, monk, uh, a peanut. And at one point during the study, they were um, kind of taking a break. I don't know if they were moving electrodes or what they were doing. And so they weren't, the monkey wasn't picking up the peanuts or anything. Um, so there was a peanut sitting on the counter and a human picked up the peanut and it caused the same electro, the same neurons to fire under the electrode as had been firing when the monkey had been reaching for the peanuts himself. And they're like, wait, why did that, why did those neurons just fire? So they had the human pick up the, the peanut again and the monkey's brain fired again. And that's how they discovered that putting yourself in the position of someone else um, is facilitate, facilitated by these mirror neurons. Um, they used to call them monkey see, monkey do neurons when they first found it and they realized no one's calling them that. So we can call them mirror neurons instead. It's really clear that from the very beginning, we are learning by observation. Here we have, um, uh, there's two cameras in this setup. The, the, what the man is doing is a uh, frame ahead of what's hap what the baby's responding with. And so you see him in the top left. Um, see he sticks out his tongue. A fraction of a second, a second later, the, the infant sticks out his tongue. He goes, ah. Fraction of a second later, the baby does it. A little kissy face, and the baby, fraction of a second later, does it. Um, so very early on, we're very responsive to facial expressions. A little later, we can see more complex behaviors where the videotape, the man is showing the um, toddler, you know, look, you can break this object. So the toddler, toddler has the object. He looks down, he breaks the object, right? So we learn through observation. We figure out what we should be doing, how the world works, what we, what we should be doing with certain objects from observation. In fact, they found that if we show children a new toy, something they've never seen before, and for half the children, we give them a little videotape of an adult interacting with a toy, and for the other children, we just let them free play with it, a lot of times the free play children will come up with a wider variety of behaviors to do with the toy, whereas the ones who watch the video will limit themselves to what they saw the adult doing. So sometimes learning by observation helps to narrow down the field of possible responses, um, maybe to the most useful ones. It's probably how we pass on culture and you know advance society through. Um, we don't all have to learn on our own all these things. We can learn from our elders. So it's probably beneficial and, and, and puts society forward. But it's probably also somewhat limiting, and it helps to constrain us to doing the stuff that our society expects of us. So pros and cons to observational learning. All right, that concludes our sequence on learning theories. So I will see you back in the next chapter.